Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Ginny LaRoe. I'm the Advocacy Director of the First Amendment Coalition. Welcome to Inside the Fight for Public Records, a lesson by and for student journalists. This is in celebration of Student Press Freedom Day, which is tomorrow, and I'll talk to you more about that. First, this recording, uh, this session is being recorded. You'll get it on email. And I want to say just a, a few thank yous to partners with us today and who are supporting Student Press Freedom by honoring Student Press Freedom Day. Uh, the Student Press Law Center, they're an amazing champion for student press rights and the creator of Student Press Freedom Day. In addition to the Student Press Law Center, our partner on this day of advocacy, um, I also just want to thank the Institute for Media and Public Trust at Fresno State, the Asian American Journalists Association, Los Angeles and SF Bay Area chapters, the California chapters of the Society of Professional Journalists, LA, San Diego, NorCal, and our national chapter. Thank you for su your support of today's program. Bay City News and the Association of LGBTQ Plus Journalists, Los Angeles chapter. These are all organizations that helped get word out to student journalists all over California for today's program. Let me just say a few words about Student Press Freedom Day. It's in its sixth year. This is an initiative of the Student Press Law Center, and this year's theme is powerfully persistent. And that perfectly describes our special guest today, student journalists from around California. One of this year's issues is promoting accountability and transparency. Let me just say a few words about that, because this is core to my organization's mission, and it's so important to all of you who have joined us today. Um, watchdog journalism is key to upholding a free and open civil society and robust democracy. And student journalists do this important work on the local level, promoting accountability and transparency within their schools and communities. And as local media sometimes shrinks and struggles to have as many journalists as they one time did, uh, students are often the only ones covering school boards, local government meetings, and other topics that require dogged persistence. Our guests today are sharing stories of being powerfully persistent, and they are also themselves watchdogs, as you will learn from their stories today. I'm excited for you to meet these intrepid and brave student journalists and um, hear about some of their real wor world reporting that you might be inspired to do at your own high school or college campus. So first, I'm gonna ask all of today's special guests to introduce themselves um, and their titles and schools and any other affiliation they want to share. And we have um, a, an advisor with us today. And then we'll turn it over to our first student journalist speaker. So please, everyone, introduce yourselves. And then we'll get to on to our presentations. Should I start? Sorry, I didn't know if you were calling on me. Sorry. Um, my name is Delilah Broomer. I am a student journalist at Los Angeles Pierce College, where I am the news editor of the Pierce Roundup, and I previously served as the editor-in-chief of the Pearl Post at Daniel Pearl Magnet High School. My name is Lee Kahn. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Citizen, a student-run community college news publication in Oakland, California. Um, we do watchdog journalism on our community college district, and how about my colleagues go next and then the advisors? Hello, my name is Lila and I am the managing editor for The Citizen. Leo? Hello, I'm Leo, um, any pronouns. I'm an investigations reporter at The Citizen. And my name is Shiloh Johnston and I am the former editor in chief of The Citizen. And I'm Eleni Gastis. I'm the emphatically proud advisor to the citizen. So happy to see you all today and also see a packed house with attendees. Thank you all. Thank you, Eleni, for making time for your students um, and former students to be here to today. And also, I just want to say Josh Moore of the Student Press Law Center is here and we'll have some important remarks at the end of today's program for you. So with that, why don't we get started? with Delilah, who's gonna to talk to you about getting started with public records reporting as she did in high school, a recent high school graduate, now as she told you in college, but 
the example you're going to share with us today is really about getting started. Maybe you have never done a public records request for information to do a story. So take it away. What should folks know? Yeah, so to start just knowing what CPRA and FOIA are, right, these are really important open government laws that CPRA is at the state level, FOIA is at the federal, that allow us to get really, really useful information for our stories from public agencies. So when you are submitting a public records request, the first thing to do is to know who you need to submit it to, right, because if you're submitting a records request, you need to submit it to a specific agency that has relevant information to you. And you need to write and submit the request letter, which we have a nice template that we will go over because I was so intimidated when I was a high school journalist submitting a public records request. And we had this template that helped so much. So I want to go over that. And I also want to say, make sure to be specific in your request, right? When you're asking for records for something, if you're specific in what you need, not only does it help them, it also helps you get your records quicker. So we can go to the next slide um, where we are going to write the request. So once you know kind of what agency you want to submit to and kind of generally what you need, you need to write the request. And if we go to the next slide, I can talk about the First Amendment Coalition sample letter. So my high school newspaper frequently submitted public records requests and I do that in college as well. And we would always use the First Amendment Coalition sample letter where basically you can use their kind of legal knowledge and your knowledge of what you're reporting on, combine those and get a really great letter that is very specific and very helpful. And that's on their website and it's free to use. Um, so I'll start by talking about our reporting um, at the Pearl Post. This happened in 2023. So basically what happened was we were reporting on something completely unrelated to um, lead found in school water fountains. We were reporting on kind of a silly social media video about students testing water fountains because everyone had talked about how some of the water fountains tasted kind of odd. And what happened was we got a tip saying the reason that they taste odd and the reason that some of them have recently been shut down is because there's high levels of lead that's been found and the district didn't really want to tell anybody. So we obviously immediately got to work. We started doing interviews. We submitted a CPRA request, which I'll get to in a second, um, asking for records about not only our school's water, but the whole district, because we really wanted to provide that crucial context. And I think that's one of the key things about records is that is if your reporting is really great, that's helpful. But if you have that data and those and that inside of records, it can really make your story come to life and really have a strong foundation. So we started doing reporting and we found that six of our school water fountains had been shut down due to dangerous levels of lead. We asked the district for information and they didn't want to give us any. Um, we asked your principal for information. He wouldn't want to give us any. So we decided to submit a CPRA request. What we found is that um, there were dangerous levels of lead found in more than 500 water fountains at our school district schools tested at a rate higher than the CDC's safety rate since 2018. And what was really interesting about this too is there's a California law requiring school districts to notify parents about if they find high lead levels, which they didn't do at our school. And we were able to find a lot of that, that data because we submitted a public records request. So if we go on to the next slide a little bit, I can show kind of what we specifically did. So this is a lot of, again, legal, stuff that I had no idea what it meant, but that's okay because it just pr promotes the like legitimacy and that they need to fill this out, right? Because we have the law on our side, you know, we have all of this important, in, um, this important legal, I don't know the word, you know what I mean? Um, I like this, to call it a right. Let's call it a right. Because right. in California, we have this state law about public records, but you also have a constitutional right to open government in California. So, um, so I agree with you, Delilah. This looks like a lot of dense, heavy information, but like you said, there's something on our website you can copy most of this verbatim. And there's another resource we'll tell you about at the end that the Student Press Law Center has for you. Yeah, and we'll definitely promote the Student Press Law Center's um, help because they've helped our newspaper a ton too. Um, and so when with our CPRA request, the real key part here is kind of in the middle. Um, we talked about we wanted records of all records of actions taken to alleviate lead problems at Daniel Pearl Minor High School, such as pipe replacement, water fountain closures, and inspections. In addition, we requested 
access to or copies of all reports or data regarding lead testing at all LAUSD schools in which lead was found in, in water at a rate of higher than 15 parts per billion. Um, and we gave dates, right? Because we didn't want records from the 1930s and we knew they couldn't probably find that either. And we wanted to be really specific and helpful to them because we knew if we helped them with finding our records, it'd be beneficial to us as well. Um, so we submitted the public records request. And if we go to the next page, um, that's just a little bit of stuff that I signed. Um, and we can go, oh, sorry. Um, that's my fault. Um, we can go back one, we can go back to the article, I think, while I wrap it up. Um, so I, I submitted the request and it took them a little while to get back to us. They have 10 days to respond to you in terms of um, giving you a response. But beyond that, if they need more time, then there's no like set time per se. But what they did was they responded in 10 days saying we need two more weeks. And we're like, okay, that makes sense. It's a lot of data. So we waited those additional two weeks. Then they gave us, I think it was, it was more than 60 pages of just little like eight point font lines of lead water testing. So we went to work, you know, we kind of divided and conquered a lot of our editors looked at all the data, compiled it, and then organized it into what is relevant here. And we found that there were, there was, there was lead at rates is in the fifties and sixties at our water fountains, which is really, really dangerous. And our reporting had really big impacts once we published it and we published it a few days after we got the records. Um, we were able to basically share the stories of our school in a really impactful way that led the district to change its goals for lead and water and change its policies for notifying parents across the board. So I think that shows that like CPRA can be really beneficial to you to do hard hitting reporting that affects your school community directly. And another like fun tidbit is we also won an award from the Society of Environmental Journalists for our reporting, which was really awesome because it showed that, you know, this local school level work was having a big impact. And I am just really proud of everybody who got involved. It wasn't just me, it was the amazing online editor, Alan, and so many of the people who were involved in this. And I think it was just really, really impactful to do this. And it was a little intimidating at first, but I want to reiterate that there are so many people here to help you. And it really wasn't that hard once we got started because we we went to resources like the Student Press Law Center and like the First Amendment Coalition. So with that, I can hand it over to Jenny and the Citizen. Thank you, Delilah. Um, we've talked about this project before in other settings. And why don't you, thinking about our audience today, there's high school journalists, college journalists from California, some outside of California, and of course, every state has some kind of sunshine law. Um, what would be your one piece of advice? You've shared a lot of tips, but what would be your one piece of advice if someone wanted to start this kind of reporting at their school? I would say the biggest thing is to be curious, to, to, to ask around, to keep your eyes and ears open because this wasn't some story we pitched. This was a tip we got based on other reporting. So if you are keeping up your sourcing in your school, if you are keeping your eyes and ears open and being really just curious and open to stories and you are looking for stories and you are hearing what your friends are talking about, what your friends' friends are talking about, what there are, what like different news releases are talking about, what other articles and other student newspapers, because a lot of times student newspapers take ideas from each other, which I think is great. So just be curious because the core of using public records is about curiosity. Well said, thank you so much. Um, I can hear the wheels turning in people's minds. They wanna get out there and ask these questions on their own campuses. And I think everyone would be well served if um, there were more stories like that directly about public health, no less. Okay, so we have some great speakers today um, who are going to talk about some several stories um, and we have a lot to get through. So we're just gonna get right into it. Lee, can you just introduce, what is The Citizen? And tell us just a little bit about your work. Yeah, hi everyone. So like I said, we're The Citizen. I already said we're a student-run community college news publication in Oakland, California. And a big chunk of our reporting is accountability journalism honed in on our very own community college district, the Peralta Community College District. 
And we are a big, big fan of using public records requests. We file them all the time. I get so excited when a new person comes in and it's their very first time filing a public records request. It's like a rite of passage here. Um, they can definitely be a very powerful tool in that hunt for the truth, especially when you're trying to find out about things that maybe your school doesn't want to tell you, like in Delilah's example, they didn't want to give you the information about lead. Um, it's honestly kind of fun, and I hope by the end of our little presentation, you'll feel inspired to wield the power of public records in your own coverage at your own school. Um, next slide, please. So well, I'll just do a quick, quick round of introductions again. Um, Lee Han, Editor-in-Chief. I stepped in as Editor-in-Chief last fall. Oh. heard from everyone yeah, okay um, okay so i'll just pass it off then uh yeah, no, to yeah i'll just go ahead and pass it off to my team now um so leo and lila will tell you about some of the ways they've woven public records into their coverage of our school and then my good buddy shiloh here will go over what we learned from suing our district for public records he's a plaintiff on our on her lawsuit that got um that story actually got picked up by some local publications here and at uh, EdSource and Inside Higher Ed covered the fact that we sued our district for public records. Um, again, I kind of hope you'll start to see how you can learn from our experience and apply it to your own school community. So next, we're gonna start with Leo. Wonderful, Leo, I can't wait to hear from you. And Lee, we'll be back to you at the end for your pro tips for everyone. So. Leo, take us away. Tell us about this story. Hello. Um, so I wrote an article on the state of the elevators in the tower building at Laney College. Um, the Laney Tower is one of our oldest buildings, and the building's two elevators have been known to have issues for years. Um, while I was working on the story, I received several tips from community members about their experiences in the elevators. The elevators had been known to shake erratically, drop multiple stories, and open on the wrong floors. In one instance, a student in a wheelchair was allegedly forced to back out of a malfunctioning elevator over a multiple inch gap and was then stuck on the third floor of the tower without a clear way to exit. I also personally experienced a malfunction in that elevator firsthand that same day, along with a fellow citizen reporter. Last May, too, our college president was injured in an alleged elevator accident in the tower after the elevator dropped several stories. Records show that he suffered a concussion as well as injuries to his neck and back, but he declined to comment on the incident. Next slide, please. So in November, around the time I received the tips about the malfunctions, um, some community members were given conflicting messages from administrators about the state of the elevators on the Laney College campus. One administrator informed students via email that some elevators on campus had been taken offline and were undergoing service. At a board meeting, however, a different administrator stated that all the elevators at Laney College were operational and had been, quote, tagged out because the district had forgotten to pay their inspection fees. When asked about the elevators in the tower building, the administrator said one has been monitorized and the other one is functional. These statements came just weeks before the citizen received the tips about the tower elevators malfunctioning with people inside. Because of the discrepancies in the information I received, it seemed like the clearest route to the truth would be to seek information about our elevators from an outside agency. I decided to request elevator inspection reports from the occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. Next slide, please. Oops, I think I, I was ahead of you. I think I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, we ended up finding that all elevators on campus had been inspected by OSHA in May 2023 after the Laney College president's alleged incident and injuries. Technicians found that several elevators weren't working properly, including the one in the tower building that we had received tips about. At the time, OSHA had found issues with the elevator's doors as well as with its telephone. OSHA also said they would not issue permits until those issues had been fixed and the inspection fees were paid. In October, OSHA issued red tags to several of the elevators to show that use was prohibited, as well as yellow tags on some for non-payment of fees. 
There was a temporary permit posted in one of the tower elevators, but it was dated back to 2021. In mid-November, according to the records, a contractor reported to OSHA that the elevator had been fixed, except for the telephone. Soon afterwards, however, we received the aforementioned tips from community members, and I experienced the malfunction as well. Next slide, please. So, several months prior to all this, I was working on a different story about the Laney elevators. I sent a records request to OSHA regarding that story as well. It took a while to get a response from them. After two and a half months of waiting around, my professor and I went to the OSHA headquarters in person. While I was there, I was able to get the contact information of one of the people in the Department of Industrial Relations. After the story was finished, we lost touch. Despite the gap in our correspondence, however, he was still willing to assist me on my more recent elevator story months later. Because of him, both public records request processes were relatively smooth and straightforward. I absolutely recommend going in person to the agencies you need answers from if you have the ability to do so, or at least being diligent about following up on your requests via email or phone correspondence. Also, be nice to your contacts. The relationship I built with my OSHA contact ended up being invaluable despite the months between our interactions. I'm so inspired by this story. And again, who can't relate to this on your own campus, whether you have elevators or other safety places where it's very dangerous for folks if things aren't operating properly, um, this merits investigation anywhere. So I, I'm so impressed by this project and I appreciate your tips. Knock on their door, show up. The government is there to respond to you. And be nice to your sources. These are people, to, these are people uh, you know, who may want to help you. Wonderful presentation, Leo. Thank you so much. Um, what, who's up next? Lila? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Lila. And as I mentioned, I'm the managing editor for The Citizen. My portion of the presentation today will be on how I have utilized the California Public Records Act for our coverage of the criminal charges against our director of public safety at Peralta. Next slide, please. So first, for a little bit of background about who the key players are for this coverage, first is Timothy Thomas, who is the Executive Director of Public Safety at Peralta, who was actually put on leave as of last Wednesday, actually. And he is the defendant in a lawsuit for an issue of elderly abuse, battery, and grand theft while he was on the clock for Peralta. He was also hit with drunk driving and concealed weapon charges on the evening of a school day. Next, we have Tom Jensen, who I'll refer to as Jensen, who is the plaintiff in the case I mentioned, and he is the elder. He is an elderly RV resident who has been located near Peralta offices for nearly 20 years. He was also involved in a case brought by another unhoused individual who has disputed with Peralta as to whether or not they controlled the streets in which he lives. Lastly is Mark Johnson, and he is the basically our director of communications, and he responds to our Public Records Act requests. Next slide, please. So for the next few slides, I have provided the date and title of the articles we are discussing to help guide us as to how the story has evolved over time and utilizing the information that we have received from Public Records Act requests. And next slide, slide please. So this first article I am showing you is in regards to a diversion request by Thomas in the elderly abuse case. The request was later rescinded the same week that this was published. As an aspect of the diversion, you'd basically need to convince the judge that you are of good character and you are a trustworthy, low-risk individual. As a part of his request, Thomas insisted that he served honorably and with distinction at his previous job where he worked for almost 10 years at another community college district. However, due to the public records requests or public records documents that were retrieved by our very own retired editor-in-chief Shiloh, who will be speaking later, we found out that this may or may not be entirely true. Shiloh requested documents pertaining to his leave, and initially they made a mistake in telling him that Thomas left while under investigation for dishonesty. Since Thomas resigned while on leave, the district was technically not supposed to release this information. It could not release anything further in terms of documentation. 
to this investigation. But regardless, this nugget of information tells us in the reader that something is off. Next slide, please. For our next article, I found out about the DUI and concealed carry gun charges by attending the court hearing for the case regarding elderly abuse. This was mentioned as a sort of by the way from the judge. After getting the re police report and other supporting documents, we were able to conclude that his drunk driving incident happened on a school day, meaning that bet between the time that he left his duties and got home, he was pulled over for DUI and gu concealed gun charges. This is an issue because our district does not let allow weapons on campus unless you get exclusive approval from the district and recent efforts by our district to get weapons off campus, which is a rule that he is supposed to be enforcing. And through a Public Records Act request, we found out that he does not have clearance to hold weapons on campus. So now we have to ask the question, was he on campus that day? And if so, can he prove that he did not have a weapon while on campus? You can see on this slide in this first communication that we received in response as to whether or not he was present at the at a district office that day, Mark Johnson replied that Thomas took the day off from work. I then asked in a separate public records request for Mr. Thomas's schedule from that week to see if he was scheduled to work. In response, I received his schedule from every day that week besides the Monday in question, which is very strange, right? I then followed up letting him know that there was a day missing and lo and behold, he was scheduled to work that day and there were no time off requests for, by Thomas for that week. Next slide, please. So I reached out to Mark Johnson regarding the inconsistent information that was provided and the comments that he had made. Here we can see how the story changed. Now, it's Johnson said in the initial statement that it was inaccurate and stated that Thomas worked from home that day. So I submitted another PRA request to see what the process was for requesting time off at our district and also any documentation just showing that he did indeed request that day off or if there's anything else they can do to confirm it. Just last Wednesday, I received a response from the district that they have no form of record that he worked remotely that day. So this is still a developing story. If this story interests you, please check back on our site. The next court hearing is March 6th, so I should have the next possibly final update on his cases by then. But the bottom line is, had we just accepted the initial response from them without following up for documentation, we would have moved forward with publishing and therefore affirming misinformation. However, since we let the readers know we're still waiting for confirmation and we did the extra work to ask the district, will you state this, where are the documents? We were able to get as close to the truth as possible and not mislead our readers. This is our job as journalists to ensure we are getting accurate information, and this means not just trusting these institutions in their responses at face value. Checking their work is absolutely crucial, and by doing so, we got a whole different aspect of the story and gave our readers the most accurate information possible. Thank you. Again, my name is Lila, and I'm passing it off to Shiloh. Thank you, Lila. So much tremendous um reporting here on, remember, a public official. For those of you at public universities, colleges, high schools, your teachers, your a lot of your security officials, your administrators are public officials, and they are subject to this kind of scrutiny. Um, so thank you for your service, Lila. These are not easy stories to do. And now we're going to talk about you guys have made it seem so easy just to get these records and do these stories. Now, Shiloh, I think you're going to give a little bit of reality check that definitely will resonate with folks here who are sending in questions. Well, what do we do if they delay? They overredact. And why don't you tell us about your story of pushing back? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so essentially today I'm just going to wait. Can you guys hear me? I had to move because of some noise upstairs. Okay, cool. You sound um, great. Yeah, so today I'm just going to talk about essentially um, using lawsuits as a tool or an instrument for getting public records, specifically um, for student publications. Um, so yeah, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so specifically, I mean, there 
essentially they come into play when you've exhausted all of your other options. So, you know, what happens when being tenacious, when knocking on all of the proverbial doors, when doing all of your follow-ups, what happens when they don't work? Um, and essentially what ends up happening when they don't work a lot of the times is you'll get only partial release of records, you'll get endless delays, or you'll just be strung along, you know, they'll say, give me, they will give us 14 days, and then they'll say, give us 60 days, and then they'll say, give us 90 days. Or sometimes they'll initially acknowledge uh, that they received your request and then no longer communicate, or they won't respond at all. And that was the dilemma that the citizen was faced in, uh, faced with, with uh, the particular investigation that I'm going to talk about today. So next slide. Um, so yeah, in the I'm not going to focus too much on the investigation because I want to get to the lawsuit, um, and especially using it as an instrument for getting uh, public records requests. Um, but uh, basically, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in 2020, in the summer of 2020, um, our district decided to switch uh, the from uh, an armed security model to an unarmed security model. Um, so at the time we were contracted with our county sheriff's department, uh, and there was a decision to move to contracting with local security companies uh, to support the local community. Um, and so our to the citizens started looking into two of the companies that our district was going to contract with and discovered that they weren't actually licensed to be security companies. Um, and so we reported it on it. And the district, of course, backed away from those contracts and decided to contract with two completely uh, different security companies that were, of course, licensed. Um, but that begged a very important question, which was why those two security companies? Why, if they weren't if they didn't meet the basic requirements for being security companies, did our district go with those two and not the two others that they ended up going with? Um, and basically, uh, we asked those questions by filing um, multiple uh, public records requests and the district, um, by not giving us what we asked for, let us know that they weren't going to answer uh, the questions that we were asking. So um, next slide. So essentially, like I said, like I showed in that first slide, we got partial records, we got endless delays, uh, we got initial responses and then uh, no further correspondence. And we got, in some cases, no response at all for over a year and a half, I think, in, in a couple cases. And so after a couple of years, I think it ended up being, we decided that we were going to file a lawsuit um, and getting ready for a lawsuit uh, takes a while. So um, on in January of 2023, we ended up filing a lawsuit. So here you can see what the uh, top page of a writ of mandate looks like when you when you send it to court. Um, next slide. So just so you can see, Hello, can I interrupt you just really yeah, quickly totally. here? Because this is this is you know a big step, and not everyone has the resources or the interest. Um, but here you have your name, you and other student journalists have your name on a lawsuit uh, that's not just against, you know, any agency, say, you know, somebody out of state or a state agency. This is your own school, right? Um, so can I, I didn't give you a heads up, so I'm just putting you on the spot here. Did yeah. you emotionally, did you have any issues? Were you scared about retaliation or did you um did you feel it was righteous uh just any thoughts if you can think back that far now personally um on top i was going to talk about this later on top of wanting the records i was tired of the district not adhering to the law and felt that this was the sound bite that i used when we kept getting interviewed but a, a bit, essentially like a pattern of disrespect right where we just felt like we weren't being taken seriously. Um, and so part of my reason for filing the lawsuit was to try to set a standard where in, in doing this, hopefully the next iterations of the citizen would be taken seriously when we were filing PRAs, right? So it was also about like the principle of it. Um, so I didn't, I wasn't really afraid of, of retaliation. For me, there was like some sort of righteousness in it. Um, but I just do want to say a little bit more about this. Um, David Rowe and Pamela Rudd were the fearless reporters that did most of the reporting on 
on the um the, on the security stuff because um you know that's the thing about community colleges at least is that there's a lot of turnover because it's only two year degrees right so I inherited this story um, after as editor in chief m after most of the reporting on the actual uh, security stuff had been done but David Rowe and Pamela Rudd had been around. Um, Another thing to point out, which I'll get to a little bit later too, right, is that uh, the names on that get on these lawsuits are the names of the people who filed those PRAs. So that's something to take into consideration when you ended up filing a lawsuit. That's a great strategy point, and that applies if you are tuning in from any state where you're interested in federal agencies and submitting FOIA requests, federal FOIA, um, or you're a professional journalist. I see some familiar names who've tuned in from who I know are out of school and journalists. Um, and this is a choice you always have to make. Who Who's going to sign the request or are you going to do it anonymously? In some states, they allow that, like California. Um, but to enforce it, you are right, as we discussed earlier. Um, you know, you have to make a choice when you go to court, whose request and who's, who's willing to be a plaintiff. So um, we won't get into too much of that, but I will say that if you want to talk about these strategy questions, uh, we have two free legal hotlines, student journalists one and ours uh, at the First Amendment Coalition, which is open to all. Uh, we can we can talk with you uh, about these sort of uh, strategy decisions as your ally. Okay, so Shyla, sorry to interrupt. Thank you for having that. Just a little pull back the curtain. What do you want to talk to talk to us about next? In the lawsuit. Oh well, yeah. Essentially, it was specifically six outstanding PRAs, most having to do um, with the security stuff, but also district credit card records. And I also just wanted to point out this was towards the beginning of the uh, of the original Tim Thomas. Uh, uh, Jensen altercation. So I wanted to point out that even back then we were looking into all of this. Um, so yeah, just next slide. Um, yeah, so nine months later, we won. Um, and it was a big success. And I feel like we accomplished a lot. And I could frame this in some sort of way, like after a long, you know, protracted ground war with the district, we broke through the front line and won a great victory for, you know, transparency and accountability with public institutions. And that's true. And it was exciting. And we really did accomplish something. But I feel like if this is going to be instructive, we have to talk about the practical realities of using a lawsuit as a tool to get public records for, for student um, publications. And the practical reality is that there are pros and cons. And I think it's um, important to talk about both of them. So next slide. Um, the pros, I think the first one to talk about um, is that public institutions don't like bad press. Um, they really don't like looking like they aren't transparent. They don't like looking like they aren't accountable, which means that they really don't want to take these cases to court. So unless you're act, act, uh, asking for the equivalent of like Watergate or something, um, they will likely settle with you out of court. And it's a good chance that you will probably get what you want. Um, the, the second one, and Delilah talked about this, is that the law is on your side. So unless they give you really good legal reasons why they're not giving you what you want, which does happen sometimes, but unless uh, they, they're giving you something like that, again, if you file a lawsuit, there's a good chance that you will get at least some of what you want. Like I said before, uh, it's great when you've exhausted your other options. Um, Student publications don't have the money or the resources or the time to do lawsuits. Um, so it's good just to point out uh, that there's a lot of lawyers out there that want to do this kind of work pro bono. Um, it, they, and you can find really good lawyers. We had an excellent lawyer. Um, and then the important one here is that once you've won, you have this in your back pocket. Um, when other public or when other public institutions, they might be stringing you along or, or you know, giving you a hard time, you can throw this card on the table and say like, hey, look, we filed a lawsuit and we've won with this kind of thing before, you know, don't jerk us around. Um, yeah, and that's important. Well uh, said. Okay, now let's, I appreciate you also getting into the reality here, the cons. And yeah. let's talk about it. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I think the first one, especially for student publication, uh, is that lawsuits can be long. 
um, like, like, like it showed in that one slide, your names are on those lawsuits. And so if you graduate and the lawsuits are still ongoing, like some of these can last, ours lasted nine months, depending on the volume that you're dealing with or how willing the pub, uh, how willing the public institutions are to work with you, they can last over a year. So if you graduated and you're moving on to a four year or you're at a four year and you're moving on to a job or other things, you're still liable. You still have to deal with it. Um, another thing is, right, if they're long, uh, the information that you're getting, even if, if you get to the end of the lawsuit and that's kind of where you get all the information, the story could no longer be timely. Uh, the evidence could be stale. So, you know, I think the most important thing for a journalist is to do what's best for the story. And if doing a lawsuit is not what's best for the story, then it might not be the best thing to file a lawsuit. Um, Another thing is that lawsuits are difficult. They really are extra responsibility on top of work, on top of school, on top of your responsibilities at home, on top of your responsibilities at the newsroom. And I think what's important here is that you can't actually share that responsibility in the newsroom. You can't talk about it with people in the newsroom. So if you're the only person who filed the PRA that you're suing over, you're the only one who's able to have that burden on your shoulders. So it's just another thing to think about. Um, and all that con, all those cons lead to a very important question. And if you have a good lawyer and we had a great lawyer, they will ask that question before the lawsuit, in the middle of the lawsuit and towards the end of that lawsuit. Next slide. And that question is, is the information you're after worth filing a lawsuit over? Like if you're just asking for something that like, is just a little detail for the story that you want, is it important enough for you to go through the entire process of a lawsuit? Uh, do the pros outweigh the cons? And then you have to ask yourself, why are you, why are you filing? Like I mentioned when, when we were talking about this earlier, part of the reason that I filed this lawsuit, why I put my name on it, other people had different reasons and I wasn't the only one who put my name on this, but part of the reason that I put my name on it was because I was filing for the principle of it. But these are all questions that you have to ask yourself. Um, next slide. And so and the lesson you, here. Yeah, thank you. And it's important for me is that the goal should be to not let it get to the point where you have to file a lawsuit. And that's not because the cons always outweigh the pros, because that's not the case. Although, like I said, the cons need to be considered. If I had to do this all over again, I absolutely would. I love all the information that we got. I love that, like, I love the message that we sent, right? But the reason that it shouldn't, we should not let it get to the point where we have to file a lawsuit is because we should want our institutions to be transparent, right? We should want our institutions to be accountable. We should want our institutions to be willing to work with us. And if we get to the point where a lawsuit is happening, that means the system has failed, right? That means that it's not working the way that it should be. We filed two separate final warning letters to our district with months apart to give them ample time to do the right thing, right? And we want our institutions to do the right thing because if they don't, they're part of a system that has failed. And if they do, they're like a shining example of what the system could be if everybody did the right thing. Thanks. Milo, thank you for that. And thank you for kind of leveling with folks that it's extra time, it's extra commitment. And if your name is on that lawsuit, it's your request, you're, you're responsible for answering questions, the court going through that process. Um, I'm sure folks will have questions for you. I just want to say, um, we'll turn to some of the questions that haven't been answered in, in the program at the end. But I I want uh, Lee as editor in chief, can you give us some general tips? Um, you know, having, you've already said this is fun for you. <laughs> so. Yes. <laughs> so much fun and also so much stress. Okay, um, thank you for acknowledging yeah. that. But so what tips have you learned working with um your great colleagues here um at the Citizen? Um my top advice right now that I would give to you is if you're looking to do this kind of thing regularly in your newsroom, you need to have a central tracking system for your own newsroom to keep track of what requests you're sending out and also make sure your staff members like 
make sure that whoever's the EIC at your newsroom is reviewing the PRAs that are getting sent out by your staff before they get sent out so that the EIC knows like, okay, this was very specific. This isn't like a super vague request, like give me all your emails. That's just gonna cause further and further delays in getting the information that you need. Um, and yeah, That's especially if, if you're in a situation like us where your district isn't doing a good job of tracking your own PRAs, it definitely helps to keep track of what PRAs that uh, are actually outstanding for you. I think uh, the citizen found that in in the past, sometimes uh, the district will give a partial response and in their own system, they'll mark it as closed and that's why they'll never respond. But to us, we look at the records and we're like, this straight up isn't what we asked for. We're missing this, 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 and this. And that's why we give these further and further follow-up. So definitely look at the documents when you get them, review them, make sure they actually fulfilled the request that you asked for and follow up as many times as you can, be annoying, email them every day. Um, if you can code, honestly, set up a bot, like whatever, just do it. Um, <laughs> and one thing that helps with getting us being very specific, as specific as you can in your records request, um, we have an anonymous leak portal on our website. Um, we use a jot form for it to do like a secure encrypted one. If you're using WordPress, that's a, they have a WordPress plugin. Um, that can be a way to get very specific information about the document that you need. Like someone could anonymously submit the document that you want through the leak portal. You can't trust that document. You can't use it necessarily, but you can use it, you can turn to the district and be like, I know the name of this document. I know what keywords are in. I know the contents of this document. Give it to me within 10 business days. And that'll help you a lot than, you know, casting a wide net of like, oh, give me all documents from this time period from this, you know. Um, what else do I have on here? I already covered, be annoying, be specific. We already covered, don't back down. When you get turned down, do your homework. Make sure you know whether or not what you're asking for is a public record. And if you don't know, contact the Student Press Law Center or the First Amendment Coalition. Um, back when Shiloh uh, did the PRA for Tim Thomas's former district, we were looking for investigation records at his former district. Um, if you look at our story, you know you'll kind of see that. At first, they they looked at what they had and they told us, we have something that's publicly disclosable, so we'll give it to you within this many business days. And then they later were like, never mind, we reviewed, we don't have anything that's disclosable. Bye, forget we ever said anything. And we we're like, wait, what? Um, and that, you know, if you ever get something like that, that's a good opportunity to like call up the SPLC, call up First Amendment Coalition and be like, what do you think is going on here? And, you know, you guys know the law better than I do. What can I do here? If you really, really care about um, getting that record. Yeah. Great tips. Uh, so many practical ones, just to amplify something you said, track your requests. Okay. So let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, hey, can I add one real quick, ooh. actually, that I've been thinking about? Heck yeah. Come okay. Um, remember that you're asking for records, not information. Um, you can't request documents that don't exist. I know that sounds really obvious, but essentially like you can't ask a public institution to produce a document that has all of the information that you want. You can only ask an institute, you can only ask a public institution for a document that already has the information, right? So you can't just like ask an institution for a document that has all of the time, all of the times that Donald Trump has said China in a speech, right? Like if that document doesn't exist, then they're not compelled to write that all down on a piece of paper and give it to you. So what you might find that all of the information that you want is out there and is publicly disclosable, but because you didn't ask for the right record, you didn't get it. So the point being that the type of record that you ask for in your PRA 
is at least as important as the information that you ask for on your PRA. So prioritize it just as much as the information that you're asking for, essentially. That's a great tip. Um, thank you for that, Shiloh. And, and I will say this is something if, if, if you're getting started with public records requests um, to keep in mind, you might be asking for an interview from the same public official, maybe a PI, a public information officer, a PR person, who might also be your point person for a public records request or a FOIA. Um, I like to say this is what I did when I was a student journalist. Those are different things, right? There's a legal requirement that they respond to records requests. There's not a legal requirement anyone give you an interview. So maybe treat those as separate and distinct serious um, requests. Um, and the folks on this, our wonderful presenters here have shared great examples of the written requests that really cite to the relevant state law that they're required to um, follow with regard to returning over records as opposed to exchanging information. Um, and that's what the focus of today's conversation has really been about, are getting those records. Um, I think it would be great if uh, if anyone wanted to talk to you more about reporting tactics, interviews, getting information outside of the request process, if you were all willing to uh, network with our other student journalists on this call, um, I will be happy to facilitate that. You will all get an email from me afterwards and we can connect about uh, networking um, and news gathering strategies. Um, what, We've alluded to some resources today, and maybe I could call on Josh, uh, Shiloh, and um, Lee just mentioned some resources. Um, Josh, why don't you tell us about some resources that the Student Press Law Center has available at no cost um, for student journalists and their supporters? Yeah, thanks, Jenny. And first, I want to thank you, Jenny, and the First Amendment Coalition for organizing this terrific conversation, and the students who've just been so inspirational. Um, and thank you all for the kind words about SPLC. Um, so we have a lot of good resources, including, as the slide shows, the public records letter generator that we have. Um, so, you know, the First Amendment Coalition has the, the template that Delilah talked about and she used in her reporting for, for California. If you're not in California and you want something very similar, our public records uh, letter generator will do basically the same thing, where you kind of input the information that you're looking for, click a button, and it spits out the letter for you with all the laws cited and, and the days that they have to respond and details like that. So that's a really helpful tool. As the site indicates, it's been used hundreds of thousands of times. Research has indicated that it's uh, a very helpful tool um, and strategy to hopefully increase your odds of getting records um, from your request. And I have to tell you, oh, sorry, I have to tell you, it was my introduction to the Student Press Law Center at the dawn of the internet. Um, as we've talked about before, I was a high school journalist and at my community college and the college that I transferred to, this somehow this records uh, letter generator was online back in the redacted years of my college journalism. And it was how I got started with making public records act requests. I certainly didn't write my own. I, this was a great tool for me. And so I hope folks can turn to it um, to get started with your own records requests. Um, what else do you have for us, Josh? Yeah, and so it's also has been alluded to, um, the SPLC has a legal hotline for all student journalists, both high school, college levels, and their advisors to call um, or to submit a question online if they have questions about censorship, about public records, um, pretty much any legal question that you encounter um, in the course of reporting for student media, we're here to help. Um, so you submit your question on the hotline, an attorney will get back to you. You can even schedule a time to chat with them on the phone. Um, you know, we'll walk you through any of these kinds of things that we can, um, and kind of as Shiloh was talking about earlier about trying to find uh, pro bono counsel, if you're really at the point of deciding to sue for public records, we can also help with that as well as the First Amendment Coalition. Thank you, Josh. And I see questions coming in that um, the answer to your question is going to be use these resources because your situation may be very fact specific. So while the Student Press Law Center um, has this amazing service, the free legal hotline. They answer every question uh, for student journalists and advisors. Um, the First Amendment Coalition, my organization's legal hotline is open to anyone. Um, so start with the Student Press Law Center if you are a student journalist or advisor, but if you're not sure that you're part of their dedicated constituency, you can come to us and uh, our free legal hotline is very similar. Uh, we have staff attorneys who are experts on open government and First Amendment issues. And you can write, you can share uh, with us a public records issue you're having and the specifics and uh, the attorneys will review it 
and give our give their expert um, information, you're not hiring us. Uh, the lawyers who work for my organization don't represent you, but they're going to give you information that we hope is empowering and uh, helps helps you break through barriers or at least understand uh, the issues. Uh, and and it's here. It's a it's a link. It's a form on our website. And I hope you all uh, use it. You'll get this link on email um, from me later. Uh, so for those of you who wrote in asking, you know, well, what do I do if I've been denied or the agency is claiming some information I want is a trade secret? These are fact specific and I would encourage you to use these uh, free resources um, to get kind of a custom private um, question and answer session going. Okay, so uh, Josh, can you also plug for us this terrific initiative? Yes, I would love to. So um, last year we started the Student Freedom of Information Award at the Student Press Law Center uh, in partnership with the Breckner Freedom of Information Project at the University of Florida. Um, and this award basically recognizes a student journalist or team of journalists for outstanding use of public records and their reporting that promotes transparency and accountability. Um, the college award comes with a $2,000 prize and the high school award comes with a $1,000 prize. So um, if that's a little bit of a motivating factor for you to be doing this terrific reporting that, that you've heard about today. Uh, the nomination form is going to be open in just a few weeks during Sunshine Week in March, so please stay tuned to that. Um, it's going to be on our website, which you can see here. It's splc.org slash awards. Um, we'll also, of course, promote it on SPLC social media and our newsletter. Um, so, you know, you can pay close attention there. Um, and of course, I have to mention that the Citizen here was our first award winner this past year, which we were very honored to recognize the terrific work that they do. Um, and if you're inspired by their work and Delilah's work, um, this is just one little extra piece of motivation to do this great work in, in your school and then submit that work to the award. Wonderful. I hope everyone applies for this award. Um, thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you, Delilah, Lee, Lee, Leo, Lila, Shiloh, and Elaine. Thank you for your inspiring remarks, for taking your time out of your reporting, your classwork to share this insight with us. Um, I want to give just a final thank you again to Student Press Law Center for creating Student Press Freedom Day um, and bringing us all together to recognize the important work being done by student journalists. Um, and I want to again thank all of today's co-sponsors, organizations that got word out to the, in your communities that we we're having this uh, session today. And I hope this is the beginning and not the end of a conversation um, about accessing public records to do journalism, to hold our public institutions accountable. Thank you all for, for being here with us today. Um, from I see people from across California and beyond, and I hope you stay in touch with these amazing brave and persistent student journalist. Thank you all and happy Student Press Freedom Day tomorrow. I hope you all celebrate with at least a post on social media. Okay, goodbye.